I think if it wasn't for an injury this year, it could have happened this year. Uh, but I think the bullpen staggered injuries at different times between Sir Anthony and Jose and the yada, yada, yada. Um, and Craig Kimbrell was like your, your steadying force there for a long portion of the year. But I thought Jose Alvarado was absolutely on a trajectory. And the Phillies are never going to have probably a true closer per se. But my prediction for 2024 is that Jose Alvarado is going to become one of the premier I'll call them high leverage relief pitchers in the National League. Um, I think this guy has figured out how to pitch. I think he's got overwhelming, overpowering stuff. And I and I think um, with the lack of a you know major closer upgrade, I think that tells you they believe that guy's in house. I think it's Jose Alvarado. I think they might possibly add a right handed complement to him for those high leverage spots, uh, a la the Kimbrel role. But I absolutely think. At the end of the year, when you look at ERA, WHIP, you know all the major pitching categories for relievers, uh, I, I think Jose Alvarado is going to be one of the tops in the NL. Yeah, and I think Jamie, that that's I don't even know how bold that is, just I, based yeah. on the numbers. Like you're right, there's probably not a de facto closer. Rob Thompson, yeah, I think he really stresses the high leverage outs, and yeah. you and I talked about that a lot during the postseason run. I know John has talked about that quite a bit as well. Where like it doesn't necessarily have to be closer or ninth inning guy. It's high leverage guy in a specific spot. And you saw Jeff Hoffman get used. Sure. Jose Alvarado get used. I know Craig Kimbrell was the closer per se, but Alvarado's numbers the last He's three filthy. years have all gone in the right direction for the most part. Uh, the walk rate has gone down. His first year in Philly, remember, he was sent down to AAA at one yeah. point. Uh, was 18%, almost 19%. 2022, he was much better. It was down to 11. Last year, it was down to under 11 at 10 and a half. The home run rate has been fairly consistent. He was 2% three years ago. He was 1.7 last year. La or, uh, this past season, 2022, he was really, really good. But the strikeout rate for his career is 30%. Ooh. He was at 38 and 37 Damn. In the last two seasons. He's figured something out. And yeah. because of that, the whip has gone down. The walks have gone down. The quality of pitch selection has been able to go up because he's not just a thrower anymore. Yeah, he figured out pitching. Yeah, and I and I really believe uh, he's going to be one of the premier bullpen arms in the National League, if not all of baseball this year. You know, the injuries uh, robbed him a little bit. Uh, so, Tyler, what is your yeah, bold so prediction? I guess uh, I'll, I'll go a little bit further. I think yours is a little more bold than yours mine. is like um, safe-ish. Yeah, yours is kind of a mild sauce. Yeah. Mine's a little bit more. I wouldn't call it hot, but you're, I talk, you're habanero. I talked maybe about a little ghost pepper in there. I talked about Brandon Marsh with Renee and Devon on Tuesday of the show, and one of my expectations for Brandon Marsh in 2024 is for him to get more consistent at bats against left-handed pitching. And now, granted, the only way that he gets more consistent at bats against left-handed pitching is that he doesn't strike out against left-handed pitching as much as he did in 2020, uh, 2023 with 43 strikeouts and 96 at-bats. And the splits are evident, right? He's a 292 hitter against right. He's a 229 hitter against lefties. If Brandon Marsh can get his 229 up to uh, 255 against lefties, I'm not asking for 300, mm -hmm. but he gets it up to like a 250, 255 range and the strikeouts go down from nearly, you know, 45% to like 35%. Brandon Marsh is conceivably like a 280, 285 type of hitter, of, you know, from both sides of the plate because he was at 277 for the season last year. He gets that to 285, 290. I think Brandon Marsh has himself a near all star level caliber 2024. Type yeah, season. I think he took a lot of strides, and, and John, you can chime in on this as well. I think offensively, when you look at um, you know the hitting coach last year uh, and the young players, you know Brandon Marsh is absolutely one of those guys. Christian Pache is in there, Bryson Stotts in there, uh, working with Kevin Long. I think they all took some like pretty long strides offensively in their batting um, approach. So I, I absolutely see Brandon Marsh getting better, and I think the lack of an added outfielder to this point tells you that they probably believe he has another gear left in him. Now, John, I'm sure you have multiple pictures of this somewhere of Brandon Marsh because your Photoshop skills have been <laughs> off the charts awesome lately. There is a there is just an image burned in the back of my brain of Brandon Marsh of like a breaking ball down towards the back foot where he is like I don't know doing a split karate chopping in between and and it's just like he's so out of whack 
because it was, you know, a, a change up or a, a, a sinker or some kind of, you know, a splitter down at the, at the back foot, which is where lefties want to sit against the left-handed hitter who they know can't turn on them. Um, you know, they don't want to let it out over the plate. I, that image is burned in my brain. And I think that image is going to so slowly start to fade away in 2024 because of what we saw a little bit of an upswing towards the, the back end of last year's regular season and into the playoffs where, you know, like they realized this can't be a, this can't be a split. This has to be Brandon Marsh's position to run with, whether it's left field or center field. I think it's going to be left. I think that you've got a guy who, if he becomes serviceable against lefties and hits as well as he did against righties, that's a 280, 285, 290 type of hitter over the course of, instead of, 300 and uh, 404 at bats probably getting closer to the 500 range yeah and if you can up those home runs a little bit and get close to that 20 range yeah i'm not sure the power ever i gets don't to think that so point. either but I, if he really could get to that 20 range like he is you know an everyday outfielder i think 15 is probably his max probably but the, if the strikeout rate comes down the rbi rate might go up sure and you saw that with bohm this year right the rbi skyrocketed Power didn't necessarily increase. Uh, John, your thoughts on Brandon Marsh? Because uh, Tyler's is much bolder than mine. As MBD points out in the chat, I'm basically a coward for my bold <laughs> prediction, uh, which is fair. Uh, but, John, what are your thoughts on Brandon Marsh uh, upping his game another level? Yeah, I mean, first of all, what a find Brandon Marsh was yeah. for the organization. You know, the, the expectations when when he arrived were not not for him to, be, to even be the caliber of player he was last season. I mean, you were looking at, all right, we need to improve defense. He, he's a glove out there. He can uh, cover a lot of ground. I don't <laughs> – to be sitting here now and having a, a, a reasonable conversation about what, how, how good he might be and throwing around some of these numbers is, is incredible. Now, can he do it? I don't know. I, I follow the logic. I think, um, yeah, you just – you know, you, you do – you. <laughs> Put in more work against lefties. Um, I do know at the winter meetings, Rob Thompson expressed uh, confidence in Marsh's ability to hit lefties. So I would expect to see some improvement there. I mean, he seems to work well with Kevin Long, um, you know, Im improving upon those numbers he had uh, with the Angels before before he got here. So hopefully there's, there's more room for improvement. He seems like a guy who works tirelessly uh to to improve now all that said moving from 229 versus lefties to 255 versus lefties that's a that's a tough task it's a hefty jump um, no doubt yeah yeah it's a hefty jump but it's not out of the realm of possibility so i think i think this is good in terms of bold but uh entirely realistic and i mean if he can if he can make that jump and uh rojas uh can be serviceable at the plate yoked johan yeah, 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 and based on based on these pictures, I mean, I'm expecting 30 home runs next year. All the yeah, time. <laughs> yeah, yeah w one last year. Uh, but yeah, but now now you've really got something going. If, if you're playing Rojas every day in center, Marsh every day in left, and um, you know, I think Marsh on to to that point, John. I think Marsh is the guy that like if he does take like the next step in his career offensively, I think he's almost like the biggest game changer for this lineup because most other guys are already kind of like maxed out like Bryson Stott. Is he going to get better? Yeah, he can, but it's going to be like a slight improvement because he was so good this year. Harper Turner Bohm kind of took that step this year a little bit. Uh, you know, Castellanos, all those guys are kind of like capped out. You yeah, know what I mean? So like they're all at their level. So if, if Marsh, Marsh is one of those guys that has a next gear available to him. So I, I, uh, I failed calculus in high school. So hopefully these, this, this analogy makes sense. I don't know. Oh, is, John, you might be better at math than, than, than me and, and Jamie, I've, but I've been on a week long bender. Um, math is not like, I don't, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's like the bell curve or like, <laughs> I don't know, like what, what the exponential rise of, of Brandon Marsh is, but like go back to 2022 60 games, uh, 60 games played against left-handed pitching, 96 at-bats. Same amount of at-bats in 2023 over the course of 72 games, which is a little strange. But um, the strikeout rate was effectively the same, but the average went up from 188 to 229. So that's a 40-point jump. Expecting another 40-point jump is is crazy. Like Because it, it's, it's a lot easier to go from 188 to 229 than it is to go from 229 to 269. 
Right. But if you can right. go from two two twenty nine, maybe maybe two fifty five was a little much. But if you can get to two forty five, forty two forty five, you get up to a uh, you know an eleven point jump to a fifteen point jump. Yeah. Maybe that's a little bit more realistic, and it still bolsters a guy who hit two ninety against righties last year. Yeah. yeah, and I, th- I think it's entirely within the, the realm of reason. I mean, the, the counter argument would be he showed all that improvement. If anything, he may be due to regress against lefties. Um, but that's not how it sounds from within the organization. Uh, it sounds like they really do have confidence in him uh, to hit lefties. <laughs> we'll see if he actually gets the opportunities. Um, but, but they're at least paying lip service to the idea that uh, – that Marsh is more of an everyday guy. Yeah. So, so, John, in our text conversation, you threw out one and you said you'll be able to back it up. Now, what is your bold prediction for 2024 in your Philadelphia Phillies? All right. I want to preface this and say it's I'm actually making a bold prediction. I'm with the chat on you, Jamie. I don't know about <laughs> is, is that what I, this, <laughs> this whole thing was about making bold predictions? I, I thought we were just saying stuff. I, <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I've never heard Jose Alvarado is like one of those guys. I just think he's going to get his national respect more this year. I think the Phillies might play 81 home games at Citizens Bank Park this year. <laughs> <laughs> they I might wear their pinstripe uniforms. <laughs> oh, wait, no, this. they won't. They're playing in London. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Does that count as a home game? I don't know. So you're wrong. <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs> this guy doesn't I even do, know baseball. I do I do think Alvarado has already established himself um, as one of the, the premier high leverage relievers in the game. Um, you know, as, as far as whether he can, can take control of some sort of closer role. You know, the, the Phillies say that. You know, they're more about mixing and matching. Anybody can pitch the ninth. But when somebody steps up and takes it, sort of like Kimbrell did in the first half of the season, uh, of course that's better. (laughs) You know, like the mix and match, if you have Kimbrell before, you know, he sort of went off the rails. I get the coward award today. It's fine. (laughs) mbd in the chat has a good one here christopher sanchez top 40 statistical starting pitcher in major league baseball that is bold and beautiful so 40 is it feels like you go no way like there's 30 teams and i don't know five starters and we're gonna look at the cy young odds it's not like the 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 prettiest list i've ever seen in my life it's not out of the realm of possibility when you go the entirety of major league baseball and you think of some of the teams whether they've got either vets who stink or young guys who maybe haven't gotten good yet and maybe a combination of the two if you're like you know the the nomad a's or, you know, pick a team in the, the AL Central that's apparently not the Royals and Tigers anymore. Like, the Twins still clearly have good pitching. To, so maybe that was an unfair statement. But if you look around the league, there's a lot of bad pitching. There's yes. a lot mm-hmm. of really, really bad pitching. And maybe 40 doesn't fall outside of the realm of unfair after all. Like, you just immediately think that seems high of a jump to take. Not really. But maybe it's not. He was great this year. I like that one, MBD. Yeah, I, you know I, I'm a coward, and you pointed it out. That's, that's a good one. You understood the assignment. I mean, at a certain point, Christopher Sanchez does just have to start getting more respect. You know, it, the numbers are there, and they continue to be there, and they continue to be there. You know, we'll we'll see if they let him pitch deeper in the games than they did last season. Um, there's I still hope so, because he earned it. Apprehension there. Yeah, exactly. He earned it. He at least earned a, a shot yeah. at it. All right, John, um, let's hear yours. All right, so... Here we go. I'm going to go with at least 100 wins for your Philadelphia Phillies wow. in 2024. It's something they've done, John, in our lifetime, what, once? Almost. One time in my lifetime. Yeah, I think. That, yeah, I, I think maybe some of those teams in the late 70s hit 100. And then, of course, the, the record is 102 in, in 2011. Uh, but but here's, here's how I got there. If you look at uh, from June 3rd on, which is fairly early in the season sure from from june 3rd on they would they went 65 and 40 this is after bottoming out at 25 and 32 65 and 40 after june 3rd that's that's already a 100 win pace so they, they played at 100 win pace for most of the season now i think they were third in baseball during that time period till the end of the year only behind the braves and dodgers right right i, I think that's accurate and then you, you factor in that okay harper returned 
sure. prior to that June third date. He was he was back in May, but he wasn't really himself yet. At least at least with the power, uh, he returned on May second. Uh, but then in June, no home runs. July, two home runs, and then he finally got back to being himself. Ten home runs in August. So you had less of Bryce Harper than than I think, than, if you, than, than a lot of people might imagine um, with him having such an, an early return. I don't think you had the real Bryce Harper until August. So if you have that Bryce Harper for a full season, uh, Trey Turner also, you know, and the, the ovation was, I think, August 4th. So until August 4th, he didn't really heat up. So again, we're going back to June 3rd. From June 3rd on, they played at 100 win pace. And Harper and Turner weren't really themselves until August. Yeah. You look at that and you're like, also, you, th- you got to think you're, you're probably, the odds are you get a better season out of Aaron Nola than you did. I was just going to say, I, I think that's totally fair to expect a better season out of Aaron yeah. Nola. So yeah. So over, over the course of the last five full seasons, so take 20, was it 2020? Did you look was, up how many teams have done this? What's that, win 100 games? Yeah. So over the course of the last five full seasons, if you take out 2020, it's gone 3-4-3-4-3. Three, four, three, four, three. Okay. So last year there okay. were three teams that won 100-plus games. Um, so it, I'm, so my, my question, I guess, if, if you don't mind, yeah, um, to just ask both of you guys, if there's projected about three or four 100-win teams, which of these 100-win teams doesn't win 100 next year? The Dodgers? The Braves? Or the Baltimore Orioles? I would probably say the Orioles. They're the three that won 100-plus games last year. I'd probably say the Orioles. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think all of them can do it again. And maybe uh, this, this year's a little bit of an anomaly, and you have sort of an extra team <laughs> over 100. Um, you know, you, you do got to think the Dodgers and the Braves are going to win 100 games. Yeah. Um, you know, the Orioles, a little less proven. Um, you know, great, great baseball team, but they don't feel it's hard to like repeat a as such a young team, too. Exactly. Um, so I'd, I'd pick the O's if I had to pick one of those three, but I still, I, th- I think it's entirely possible that they they all do it again. So and, the uh, the, the next join them. The next team that won the the fourth most games was Tampa. They won ninety nine. So Tampa, Toronto. And if Wander Franco wasn't a Crete, they probably, you know, maybe might Houston, get that extra maybe win Texas. Or two. Those are like your 90 plus win teams from a season ago in the American League. I, a hundred's a lot. So I just, <laughs> that's I just like, that's all I keep coming back to. It's so many wins for a team that has clearly proven that they're a much better postseason team than they are a 162 game team. Mm. I, if you said 95, I like that that gap between ninety five and hundred feels a lot to me. It feels a lot, but again, you look at it, and granted, I'm I'm looking at okay, everything that went right last season goes right again, and on top of it, <laughs> you you mix in this, these extras. Some things might just go wrong. You could have injuries. Who knows? Um, but the talent, I think, the talent is there. I, yeah, I think you know, if it wasn't for these slow stars the past couple seasons, um, I think the yes, they they have demonstrated so far that they're better in a short in a short series but you look at their their rotation they have they have five quality starters that's the the type of thing that can set you up to really go on some on some big runs um and i can see it happen and then uh one final note on that is just because the braves will also be winning so many games if the phillies are sort of off the charts and knock them down a couple yeah, it might knock that, them down a couple, but the competition would would keep things going right through the very end of the season. Where uh, whereas a lot of times teams might be up in the high 90s, and then they start setting up the rotation because you know they've they've got first place locked down. I, I don't think that would happen for the Phillies. I think the Braves would be right there, and they'd have to play uh, play everything out right through to the end. Yeah, that's why I, I picked the Orioles reason. for that same reason because I think the AL East is not going to be as bad as it was last year. The Yankees have already improved. You would think the Red Sox are eventually going to do something, but who knows? And, and I hate to say it because they're they're a young group for the most part. This almost feels like a make or break season for the Blue Jays. Yeah, and the Blue Jays should be better. They've had this core too. together for a while. The Vlad Guerrero, Bo Bichette, um, uh, Kevin Biggio group with you know, and they added di- Springer, different levels like, of success, yeah. right? And and Springer was added. I think that maybe it's unfair because the guys are like 24, 25, 23. But it feels like one of those 
you're starting to think about things season if things don't go their way. 